Radical, episode 181. Welcome to Radical, ladies and gents. I'm your host, Shane Hazel. The lights are low here in the studio. I am uh, I'm messing around with some sound. I'm messing around with a whole lot of things in uh, in the studio right now in terms of trying to just tweak it, see where it is, and, and get it just right. And uh, I thought today would be a great time uh, to get into some Lysander Spooner and some Murray Rothbard. But first and foremost, so I got to put out all the admin stuff. Uh, if you love the show, you can go to patreon.com slash radical pod and become a, a patron, uh, become a patron as low as a dollar. And I appreciate all of those that you guys that have. I've got some uh, to, to get with here and uh, catch up on some messages. So thank you guys for bearing with me through the holidays. Uh, as we get into 2022 here, welcome to anybody and everybody that's here. Uh, if you don't have a lot to uh, support the show with and you've been here for a while, go out and support me through uh, leaving a five-star review on Apple. Uh, really lifts me up and uh, it helps us uh, break through the algorithms out there. And I, I really, I can't, I can't thank all of you guys enough that have, and uh, I will read those here on the air five stars. Thank you very much. And if you got something to bring to my attention, you can go to Shane at radicalpod.com uh, and uh, leave me an email. So anyway, without further ado, uh, one of you guys out there, uh, and I, I don't say names on purpose unless if you got something to bring to my attention or you want me to do a show on something, I'm happy to do those things. If you want me to mention you on the air, I'm happy to give you credit for those things um, because it obviously helps me come out and just do easier shows like this one where I'm kind of testing sound, uh, kind of testing a, a layout in terms of the visuals lighting and all that kind of stuff like there's there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that's going on right now so um this one uh came to me uh through a listener and they said hey uh what do you think of Lysander Spooner I haven't heard you uh you read them and uh I really have only read I think you know some current events type of stuff and the anti-federalists on the show and I, I, I kind of stick with a theme because the anti-federalists were the quote unquote people who uh, founded the different states of America. They did not f found uh, the United States of America under the constitutional Republic. Um, they were the, the guys that, you know, founded the 13 original states and fought the, the, the British. So um, I haven't gone into Spooner. Spooner uh, was alive from the early 1800s through the late 1800s. He's actually a pretty old guy when he died, but uh, he was an anarchist and an unpopular one at the time. And um, I guess probably in the um, 1960s, 1970s, uh, he, he, a lot of his stuff was uncovered and, uh, there's a, a great piece. This is over on uh, Mises.org. If you don't know Mises, Man, go over and check out Mises.org. Like, there's a ton over there for you guys, especially if you're getting into uh, Austrian uh, economics. I mean, it's it's one of those things where I know a lot of you guys maybe shy away from things like this, but uh, it's critically important. And, you know, the understanding of economics and why it's so critical to human interaction, I think, is probably one of the most understudied, misunderstood, not well communicated subjects out there. So I thought today might be a great time to uh, kind of combine all of this. And um, the the introduction on this piece that I'm going to read to you guys today was done by Murray Rothbard. It is a Lysander Spooner piece. Uh, the piece by uh, Lysander Spooner is called Vices Are Not Crimes, A Vindication of Moral Liberty. And why is this important going into 2022? As we talk about decentralization, which was trending uh, just a couple days ago on Twitter, uh, as we talk about decentralization and the states becoming, you know, more, I say, more powerful than the Fed, federal government at that point, uh, as, as we begin to get away from this idea that centralized planning, centralized banks, centralized currency, centralized uh, economies are a good thing and we get into decentralized economies and we get into decentralized banks like you're your own bank with bitcoin things like that uh as as we naturally tend to move away from these draconian tyrannical types of practices that we were told in the murder cult institutions 
uh, were good, uh, we're naturally going to see some things. And I think it's extremely important to understand where we can go with these and why some of us have a, you know, especially from the neocon side in terms of quote unquote morality. I see people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and uh, a lot of people talking about how we need to institute, institutionalize Christian Judeo values. And that's not quite um, what we should be talking about. What we should be talking about is freedom for all. Uh, freedom and choices as long as people are peaceful and haven't hurt anybody. And we should be talking about um, how a Austrian type of system naturally kind of leads to uh, a society, you know, that I think Judeo-Christian type of ideology kind of really lent it to. Well, we, we've talked a, bit in, in a little bit in the past about delayed gratification um, and low time preference and things like that, which are uh, you know big topics, obviously, in uh, not only Austrian economics, but in Bitcoin and everything else. So with with this type of economy, we can expect people to have you know lower time preferences and to have uh, a lot more respect for delayed gratification, which leads to a, a a better uh, society in general because it takes away uh, the urge and the centralization of force and coercion, uh, and, and and that also you know obviously applies to our morality. So, um, without further ado, I'm gonna I'm, I'm not gonna get through this entire thing, um, and maybe it'll be a two part, maybe even a three part um, series. But vices are not crimes. I think this, like I said, I think this is important as we decentralize to start understanding that we can't control people morally. Um, you know, there are laws on the books for everything. There are laws on the books for murder and rape and assault and kidnapping. And people still do those things. Laws, like we say a lot, and, and especially in the Libertarian Party, is laws don't stop crime. And when we introduce more and more and more laws, what we're doing is obviously growing the state and centralizing power. And that's not what we need to be doing. We need to decentralize it as much as possible. And so without further ado, Mr. Murray Rothbard and Lysander Spinner are going to help us understand a little bit of this. So introduction by Murray Rothbard. Vices are not crimes. A vindication of moral liberty by Lysander Spooner. And this was published uh, originally printed in 1875. It's online at the uh, Mises Institute. Uh, since 2020, and we'll get going here. We are all indebted to Carl Watner for uncovering an unknown work by the great Lysander Spooner, one that managed to escape the editor of Spooner's collected works. Both the title and the substance of Vices Are Not Crimes highlight the unique role that morality and moral principle had for Spooner among the anarchists and libertarians of his day. For Spooner, was the last of the great natural rights theorists among anarchists, classical liberals, or moral theorists generally. The doctrine, old heir of natural law, natural rights tradition of the 17th and 18th century was fighting a regard battle against the collapse of the idea of the scientific and rational morality, or of the science of justice, or of individual right. Not only had natural law and natural rights given way throughout society to the arbitrary rule, rule of utilitarian calculation of nihilistic whim, but the same degenerative process had occurred among libertarians and anarchists as well. Spooner knew that the foundation for individual rights and liberty was tinsel if all values and ethics were arbitrarily and arbitrary and subjective. Yet, even in his own anarchist movement, Spooner was the last of the old guard believers in natural rights. His successors in the individual individualist anarchist movement, led by Benjamin R. Tucker, all proclaimed arbitrary whim and might makes right as the foundation of the libertarian moral theory. And yet, Spooner knew that this was no foundation at all. For the one state is far mightier than any individual, and if the individual cannot use a theory of justice 
as his armor against state oppression, then he has no solid base from which to roll back that defeat. With the emphasis on cognitive moral principles and natural rights, Spooner must have looked hopelessly old-fashioned to Tucker and young anarchist of the 1870s and 1880s. And yet now, a century later, it is the latter's one fashionable nihilism and tough amoralism that strike us at being empty and destructive of the very liberty they are all tried hard to bring about. We are now beginning to recapture the once great tradition of objectively grounded rights of the individual in philosophy, in economics, in social analysts. We are beginning to see that the tossing aside of moral rights was not the brave new world it once seemed, but rather a long and disastrous detour in the political philosophy, which is now fortunately drawing to a close. Uh, and he said this back in the 70s. So at, at some points I may interject. He saw this back in the 70s as it was drawing to a close. That this this government, its awfulness and everything else that it is, uh, was finally coming undone. He's only about 40, 50 years off here. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, obviously, um, this is this is pretty close. Opponents of the idea of an objective morality commonly charge that moral theory functions as a tyranny over the individual. This, of course, happens with many theories of morality, but it cannot happen when the moral theory makes a sharp and clear distinction between vices and crimes. The immoral or the vicious may consist of a myriad of human actions from matters of vital importance down to being nasty to one's neighbor or to willful to willful failure to make to take on one's vitamins but none of them should be confused with an action that should be quote illegal that is an action to be prohibited by the violence of law the latter in spooner's libertarian view should be confined strictly to the initiation of violence against the rights of a person and property. He's absolutely right here. This is where we begin to understand the, the idea that when you hurt in, in, in the legal sense, murder, rape, assault, kidnap, coerce, uh, you know, vandalize of those, that is the only time anybody with a badge and a gun or from the state uh, quote unquote, from a government should ever uh, be contacting, harassing, caging, or killing somebody. That's it. Other moral theories attempt to apply the law, the engine of socially limited violence, to compelling obedience to various norms of behavior. In contrast, libertarian moral theory asserts that immorality and injustice of interfering with any man's, or rather, any non-criminal man's right to run his own life and property without interference. For the natural rights libertarian, then his cognitive theory of justice is a great bulwark against the state eternal's invasion of his rights, in contrast to the other moral theories that attempt to employ the state to combat immorality. It is instructive to consider Spooner and his essay in the light of the fascinating insights into the 19th century American politics provided in recent years by the new political history. While this new history has been applied to most of the 19th century, the best work has been done for the Midwest after the Civil War, in particular, the brilliant study by Paul Kepler. Kepler, Kepler, yeah, Kepler, I can't say his name, Kepler. Klepner, the cross of culture. <laughs> Sorry for this doubling there, guys. What I'm going to do it again. What Klepner and others have shown in the political ideas of Americans can be reduced with almost remarkable precision back to their religious attitudes and beliefs. In particular, their political and economic views depend on the degree to which they conform to those two basic poles of Christian belief, piousic or liturgical 
although the latter might be amended to the liturgical plus doctrinal, pious by the 19th century meant all groups of Protestants except for the Episcopalian, High Church of Lutheran, and the Orthodox Calvinists. Liturgical meant for the latter plus Roman Catholic and pietistic attitudes of often included deist and atheist. Briefly, the pious tends to hold that to truly that that to be truly religious, a person must experience an emotional conversion. The convert, in what has been called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, has a direct relationship to God or to Jesus. The liturgical, on the other hand, is interested in either doctrinal belief or the following of prescribed church ritual as the key to salvation. Boy, um, maybe pause here for just for a second. When, when we talk about society today, and I talk about the miracle all the time, uh, the liturgical, this this direct relationship uh, I should say this this doctrinal belief in the following of the prescribed church ritual as seen uh, to the key of salvation. I mean, replace a couple words here. Doctrinal belief in science as what's going to, uh, I don't know, save mankind from overwhelming uh, numbers of death, right? Salvation. This is... This is kind of what we see now, only I would not say that, quote unquote, the, um, you know, this, this, this really represents both the left and the right, the liturgical, whereas maybe more so the, uh, the, the libertarian uh, has more of a, a direct relationship uh, with what they consider a higher power, you know, and that's, I don't know, I'm not, I don't want to get into specifics. I don't want to generalize, but like, I definitely see, you know, the, the liturgical side of the United States right now has just been such a beating and thank God they're falling on their face. He goes on. Now it might seem as if the piastic emphasis on the individual might lead to a political individualism to the belief that the state may not interfere in an, in an individual's moral choices and the actions and their actions. In the 17th century, pious, pietism is often meant just that. But by the 19th century, unfortunately, such was not the case. Most pious looked the following, looked, took the following view. Since we can't gauge an individual's morality by his following of rituals or even by his professed adherence to creed, we must watch his actions and see if he's really moral. From there, the pious concluded that it was everyone's moral duty to his own salvation to see to it that his fellow men, as well as himself, are kept out of temptation's path. Oh, this is the slippery slope that we're going to get into. That is, it was supposed to be the state's business to enforce compulsory morality to create the the proper moral climate for maximizing salvation. In short, instead of an individualist, the pious now tended to become a pest, a busybody, a moral watchdog for his fellow man, and a compulsory moralist using the state to outlaw vice as well as crime. The liturgicals, on the other hand, took the view that morality and salvation were to be achieved by following the creed and the rituals of their church. The experts on those church beliefs and practices were, of course, not the state, but the priests or the bishops of the church, or, in the case of the few Orthodox Calvinists, the ministers. The liturgical secure in their church teachings and practices simply wanted to be left alone to follow the counsel of their priests. They were not interested in pestering or forcing their fellow human beings into being saved. And they believed profoundly that morality was not the business of the state, but only of their own church mentors. Yeah, this is, um, this is something we see here in the South a lot. You know, the, the, the forcing of morals on other people. 
if the drug war doesn't smack you in the face right now, you, you haven't been paying attention. From the 1850s to the 1890s, the Republican Party was almost exclusively the pious party, known commonly as the party of great moral ideas. The Democratic Party, on the other hand, was almost exclusively the liturgical party and was known widely as the party of personal liberty. Specifically, after the Civil War, there were three interconnected local struggles that kept reappearing throughout, the America, throughout America. In each case, the Republicans and the Democrats played out their contrasting roles. These were the attempt by pious groups, almost always the Republicans, to enforce prohibition, the attempt by the same group to enforce Sunday blue laws, and the attempt by the self-same pious to enforce compulsory attendance in public schools in order to use these schools to Christianize the Catholics. What are the political and economic struggles that histor historians have until recently focused on almost exclusively sound money versus fiat money or silver inflation, free trade versus a protective tariff, free markets versus government regulation, and small versus large government spending. Is it true that these were fought out repeatedly, but these were on the national level and generally remote from the concerns of the average person? I have long wondered how it was the 19th century saw the mass of the public get highly excited about such recondite matters as tariff, bank, credits, or the currency. How could that happen when it was almost impos impossible to interest the mass of the public in these matters today? Kepner and the others have provided the missing link, the middle term between these abstract economic issues and the gut social issues close to the hearts and lives of the public. Specifically, the Democrats who, at least until 1896, favored the free market libertarian position on all these economic issues, linked them, and properly so, in the minds of these liturgical supporters with their opposition to prohibition, blue laws, etc. The Democrats pointed out that all these status economic measures, including inflation, were paternalistic in the same way as the hated pietistic invasion of their personal liberty. And that way, the Democratic leaders were able to raise the consciousness of their followers from their local and personal concerns to wider and more abstract economic issues, and to take the libertarian position on all of them. The pious Republican did similarly for their mass base, pointing out that the big government should regulate and control economic matters as it should control morality. And the stance the Republicans followed in the footsteps of their predecessors, the Whigs, who, for example, were generally the fathers of the public school system in their local areas. You hear that, Republicans? Whigs? You guys and a lot of the, um, I don't know, the, the progressives of the 1800s, helped usher in the public school system what a oh golly what a terrible thing what a terrible era that has been i think it's coming to a close but i just just got to point these things out generally mind your own business liturgicals almost in, instinctively took the libertarian position on every question but there was of course one one area before the civil war where pestering and hectoring were needed to write a monstrous injustice, slavery. Here, the typical pious a concern with the universal moral principles and seeing them put into action brought us an abolitionist, anti-slavery movements. Slavery was the great flaw in the American system in more senses than one, for it was also the flaw in the instinctive liturgical resentment against great moral crusades. To return now to Lysander Spooner. Spooner, born in New England in a pious tradition, 
began his distinguished ideological career as an all-out abolitionist. Despite differences over interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, Spooner was basically in the anarchist, no government, Garrisonian wing of the abolitionist movement, the wing that sought abolition of slavery, not through the use of central government, which was in any case dominated by the South, but by a combination of moral fervor and slave rebellion. Far from being fervent supporters of the Union, the Garrisonians held that the northern states should secede from a pro-slaveholding United States of America. So far, Spooner and the Garrisonians took the proper libertarian approach towards slavery. But the tragic betrayal came when the Union went to war with the southern states over the issue of their declared independence. Garrison and his former no-government movement forgot their anarchist principles and the enthusiasm of militarism, mass murder, and centralized statism on behalf of what they correctly figured would be a war against slavery. Only Lysander Spooner and a very few others stood four square against his, this betrayal. Only Spooner realized it would be compounding crime and error to try to use government to right the wrongs committed by another government. And so, among his pietistic and moralizing anti-slavery colleagues, only Spooner was able to see with shining clarity, despite all temptations, the stark difference between vice and crime. He saw that it was correct to denounce the crimes of government, but that it was only compounding those crimes to maximize government power as an attempted remedy. Spooner never followed the other pious in endorsing crime or in trying to outlaw vice. Spooner's anarch anarchism was, like his abolitionism, another valuable part of his pious legacy. For here again, his pious concern for universal principles in this case, as in the case of slavery, for the complete triumph of justice and the elimination of injustice, brought him to a consistent and courageous application of the libertarian principles where it was not socially convenient, to put it mildly, to have a, to have raised the question. Talk about a suppressed intellectual tradition. While the, while the liturgicals proved to be far more libertarian than the pious during the second half of the 19th century, a pious spirit is always important in libertarianism to emphasize a tireless determination to eradicate crime and injustice. Surely, it is no accident that Spooner's greatest and most fervent anarchist tracks were directed in dialogue against the Democrat, Democrats Cleveland and Bayard. He did not bother with, the open, with openly status Republicans. A, pi a piastic leaven in the quasi-libertarian liturgical lump, but it takes firmness and libertarian principle to make sure to confine one's pietistic moral crusade to crime, e.g. slavery, statism, and not have it spill over to what anyone might designate as vice. Fortunately, we have the immortal Lysander Spooner in his life and in his works to guide us along the correct path. Murray Rothbard, Los Altos, California, 1977. So that is the introduction. And let's see, how far into this are we? We are 31 minutes already into this. Take a brief sip of water. I'm going to go for a little bit longer. But uh, I think my voice is going to check out a little earlier than I thought it, I wanted it to today. Um, we'll go through a little bit of this and, and talk. Uh, but I'll tell you, you know, the, the idea that when push came to shove for a civil war, um, Lysander Spooner was not all about using the force of government to the abolition of slavery because he knew what it would do. He knew that war uh, destroys poor and middle class, 
and a lot of times it enriches uh, the banks, especially, and it enriches politicians and it enriches those who are part of the war machine. And he didn't want to use it. And, you know, in, in that, you know, in that vein, he was absolutely pure for, for the lack of a better term. I mean, absolutely. Mostly <laughs> the large majority pure in his idea that, you know, the state can't help us. Now, a lot of people I've heard want to go to war with the state to abolish when, you know, what's going on, you know, and naturally what's going to happen if we are peaceful enough and mostly uh, patient enough is their economy is going to fall apart and people are just going to decentralize and nullify and localize what they need to have done um, at their local level. And I think that's really, really something that we don't talk about enough. Um, you know, going, going to war with a falling empire is an extremely dangerous um, question. You know, like we, and I don't even know that it's a question. We, we, proposition, extremely dangerous pop proposition. That's the last thing that we need to do is go to war with D.C. as states. Because some states will fight with D.C. and some states will fight against D.C. And when it's all said and done, it's the people in the middle and the peaceful people that are going to pay the highest price for that. And it's absolutely, you know, that's that's the thing. It's compounding crime at that point. All right, so let's do this. The vices are not crimes. A Vindication of Moral Liberty, 1875. Lysander Spooner. Vices are those acts by which a man harms himself or his property. Crimes are those acts by which one man harms the person or property of another. Vices are simply the errors which a man makes in his search after his own happiness. Unlike crimes, they imply no malice towards others and no interference with their persons or property. And vices, the very essence of a crime, that is, the design to injure the person or property of another, is wanting. It is a maxim of the law that there can be no crime without a criminal intent, that is, without the intent to invade the person or property of another. But no one ever practices a vice with any such criminal intent. He practices his vice for his own happiness solely, and not from any malice towards others. Unless this clear distinction between vices and crimes be made and recognized by the laws, there can be on earth no such thing as individual right, liberty, or property. No such things as the right of one man to control of his own person and property and the corresponding and co-equal rights of another man to control of his own person and property. For a government to declare a vice to be a crime and to punish it as such is an attempt to falsify the very nature of things. It is as absurd as it would be to declare truth to be a falsehood or falsehood truth. Every voluntary act of a man's life is either virtuous or vicious. That is to say, it is either in accordance or in conflict with those natural laws of matter and mind on which his physical, mental, and emotional health and well-being depend. In other words, every act of his life tends on the whole either to his happiness or to his unhappiness. No single act in his whole existence is indifferent. Furthermore, each human being differs in his physical, mental, and emotional, and emotional construction, and also in his circumstances by which he is surrounded from every other human being. Many acts, therefore, that are virtuous and tend to happiness, in the case of one person, are vicious and tend to unhappiness in the case of another person. Many acts also that are virtuous and tend to happiness in the case of one man at one time and under one set of circumstances are vicious and tend to unhappiness in the case of the same man at another time 
and under other circumstances. So he's getting going here, guys. And I mean, this he's setting, you know, he's he's setting some very, very sound, very principled life, liberty, and property are yours. They are nobody else's. Anybody else who claims to have a I don't know, any type of say, any type of uh, action over your life, liberty, or property is, you know, as long as you're not hurting anybody else for taking their stuff, he's saying it's obviously, uh, it, it can't work. You can't, you can't speak of rights and, you know, I guess interweave crime and vice. You can't do it. Every voluntary act of a man's life is either virtuous or vicious. Nope. Wrong paragraph. Paragraph three. To know what actions are virtuous and what are vicious. In other words, to know what actions tend to the whole, to the happiness, and to what unhappiness in the case of each and every man and each and all of the conditions in which they may severely be placed is the profoundest and most complex study to which the greatest human mind ever has been or ever can be directed. It is nevertheless the constant study to which each and every man, the humblest in intellect, as well as the greatest, is necessarily driven by the desires and necessities of his own existence. It is also the study in which each and every person from his cradle to his grave must necessarily form his own conclusions because no one else knows or feels or can know or feel as he knows and feels the desires and the necessities, the hopes and fears and impulses of his own nature or the pressure of his own circumstances. It is often possible to say of those acts that are called vices that they really are vices, except in degree. That is, is it difficult to say of any actions of courses of action that are called vices that they really would have been vices if they had been stopped short of a certain point? The question of virtue or vice, therefore, in all such cases, is a question of quantity and degree and not of the intrinsic character of any single act by itself. This fact adds to the difficulty not to say the impossibility of any one except each individual for himself. Drawing an accurate line or anything like any accurate line between virtue and vice that is, of telling where virtue ends and vice begins. And this is another reason why the whole question of virtue and vice should be left for each person to settle for himself. Vices are usually pleasurable, at least for a time being, and often do not disclose themselves by, as vices by their effects until they have been practiced for many years, perhaps even a lifetime. To many, perhaps most, of those who practice them, they do not disclose themselves as vices at all during life. Virtues, on the other hand, often appear so harsh and rugged, they require the sacrifice of so much present happiness, at least, and the results which alone prove them to be virtues are often so distant and so obscure, in fact, so absolutely invisible to the minds of many, especially the young, that from the very nature of things, there can be no universal or even general knowledge that they are virtues. In truth, the studies of profound philosophers have been expended, if not wholly in vain, certainly with very small results and efforts to draw the lines between virtues and vices. If then it became so difficult 
so nearly impossible in most cases to determine what is and what is not vice, and especially if it be so difficult in nearly all cases to determine where virtue ends and vice begins, and if these questions, which no one can really and truly determine for anybody but himself, are not to be left free and open for experiment by all, each person is deprived of the highest of all his rights as a human being, to wit, his right to inquire, investigate, reason, try experiments, judge and ascertain for himself what is to him virtue and what is to him vice. In other words, what on the whole conduces to his happiness and what on the whole tends to his unhappiness. If this great right is not to be left free and open to all, then each man's whole right as a reasoning human being to liberty and the pursuit of happiness is denied to him. And I think that's where we'll stop. And I'm going to kind of talk about this for a second. What he's talking about, maybe, you know, I don't know. Some of you guys are younger, haven't uh, haven't defied the state as maybe as much as uh, I have. What he's talking about is in any given time, a vice might look like a vice to somebody else. If we're talking about low time preferential in terms of, you know, a, a virtue, you know, virtues are things that we put off today, immediate gratification today uh, for delayed gratification tomorrow could by some be looked at as a vice. And what if somebody said, you can't save for tomorrow. You can't, you can't delay gratification for another time. Those of you guys that are like me, I mean, you'd be like, what? What are you talking about, man? I can't save. I can't, I can't, you know, put off gratification today uh, for, you know, a, a later gratification tomorrow. If I was the kid in the marshmallow experiment where they said, hey, man, you're five years old. Here's a marshmallow. If you don't eat that in five minutes, when I come back, I'll bring you another marshmallow. What if they just said, you have to eat the marshmallow? And if you don't, it's a vice. This is the type of questioning and philosophical work that must be worked out. And the only way it can be worked out is by you. What you do, what you don't do in your pursuit of happiness in this life is yours. Like, here's the thing is, for some people, cannabis works wonders. For other people, cannabis doesn't work so much. And that's the thing is vice versus virtue. And who's to say? I think it is one of the, I don't know, most self-centered, megalomaniac type of uh, reasoning for anybody out there to see one thing in their own life and mean that somebody else must apply it to their life or they're going to use the state against those people to harass them, to cage them, and possibly kill them. And that's what we're talking about here. This is, this is the right to be free. As long as you're not hurting people and taking their stuff, what we talk about all the time in, in much more uh, detail, in more philosophical terms, this is what Lysander Spinner is getting at is just because you do something today as a virtue, years from now, it might be a vice and so on. And so if virtue and vice can come and go as you age in, in a single person's life and vice and virtue can come and go in other people's lives the same way, who's to determine these things should be controlled by a centralized power. It's impossible. It's, it's damn near one of the, it, 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 it doesn't lend itself to a free society at all. And that's basically what they're getting at here. Vice versus virtue. And as we decentralize, we will, you know, we're, we're going to have to come to this conclusion. We're going to have to leave peaceful people alone. That's what it, this is what this 
all boils down to. You don't know other people. You don't know where they're coming from. You have no idea what they've been through. And, you know, in terms of, I don't know, body chemistry, emotional, physical, whatever it is that helps them make the best out of life, this tragic comedy that we're living in, like, you don't have a say in that. And when they cross the line and they hurt life, liberty, or property of somebody else, that is when we have, you know, the ability to step in and say, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't get to, you don't get to mess around with other people's rights either. That's it. That's where this one ends. That's where we're going to stop for this episode, 181. I will continue this in 182. We'll pick up with section, um, I believe, five here, and we'll just go from there. But uh, thank you guys for tuning in. I know maybe a little bit different show and all that fun stuff. I hope you like it. Uh, leave me comments. Contact me at Shane at RadicalPod.com. You can support the show. I said earlier uh, at Patreon.com slash RadicalPod. And uh, you can go out there and subscribe and like and share and all that fun stuff. But until next time, I love you. I need you. Peace. Um, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff.